All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to um, all of our participants around the world. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's discussion on financing solar powered livelihoods and income generation. On behalf of the People Centered Accelerator, and in collaboration this time with our colleagues at the Mini Grids Partnership, a consortium of over 300 stakeholders in the mini good space, we are delighted to be hosting today's webinar, featuring exciting research from our partner, the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, or CEW. This work is incredibly relevant to the PCA, as livelihoods are such an important part of what energy access can unlock for a household, for an entrepreneur, for communities. My name is Hannah Gerardo. I'm the Energy Access and Gender Consultant at SE for All, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. In terms of the flow today, we will hear from presenters listed here. Sasmita Patnayak, Program Lead at CEW, will take about 25 minutes to walk us through her team's research on financing solar powered technologies in India. Huda Jaffer, Lead Designer at the Cellcode Foundation, will walk us through some of their on the ground experiences in this arena. And then lastly, Diana Col Kolani, Regional Head of Programs at Energy for Impact, will offer us an East African perspective um, from E4I's experience promoting productive uses of energy. We will aim to have as much time as possible for an exchange with all of you at the end. And on that note, the best way for you to submit questions is through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. If you can please remember to share your name and organization, that would be helpful for us as well. I will also note that we will send the slides around afterwards, as well as posting recording for anyone who wasn't able to join us at this time. And with that, I will hand it over to Sasmita to kick us off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. My audible. Hello. We can hear you. We can hear you. Sounds good. Okay. All right. I was just checking. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Shelly Cha, who's also a co-author on this report. Um, so the study is focused on understanding uh, the financing needs of micro enterprises that use solar powered livelihood appliances. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, I work for this organization called the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, which is uh, just, I'm just getting a little bit of echo. I'll try to switch up. For what it's worth, I don't know if we heard an echo. Okay. No, I, I'm just hearing my own voice. Ah, shoot. <laughs> okay, uh, so we work on multiple uh, um, issues relating to energy, environment, and water. And uh, I work at the Energy Access team, which is under which we conduct this project. Shoot, Sesmita, unfortunately, we are hearing that echo now. Um, is it possible that you have two microphones on? Um, on a computer or a, actually. Yeah, is it fine now? It sounds better. Why don't you go ahead and we'll see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next slide, please. Um, so CW has been working on uh, livelihoods uh, and energy access, the convergence of it since 2017. And the idea was to understand what are the needs of these micro enterprises and what are the gaps at the ecosystem level that is required for uh, adoption of uh, solar powered livelihood appliances. And we realized that a high, the high apex cost associated with these appliances become a challenge for some of these smaller uh, organizations to adopt the technology. Uh, and that coupled with lack of access to financing for these uh, kind of businesses become a bigger impediment to adoption of the technology. Uh, next slide, please. 
So with that in mind, we uh, did a study to understand what are the perspectives of the financiers, uh, what prevents them from lending for these uh, products. Uh, and we thought if there could be a business case to make, uh, to see what is the kind of income these enterprises are making after adoption of the technology, and uh, what are the existing government policies that exist, uh, uh, which can be leveraged by these um, businesses to then um, start adopting these technologies. So for understanding the perspectives of financiers, we interviewed a set of uh, bankers and implementers in at the national level and two states in India, Orissa and Assam. And this included financial regulators, government ministries, uh, uh, MFIs, microfinance institutions and associations. Uh, we also, uh, with our uh, partner Selco Foundation, which has been working in the state of Karnataka and now in other states across the country uh, on solar powered livelihoods, we collected data for 300 micro enterprises in the state of Karnataka. And we wanted to understand their financial information, uh, starting from annual revenue to net income to cash flow frequencies, um, to see if there was an improvement in income for these uh, micro enterprises once they started adopting these technologies. In addition to that, we started looking at the existing government schemes for micro businesses, uh, existing government schemes on solar powered appliances and existing government schemes for uh, mechanization in general. Next slide, please. The next one. Um, so, I mean, though we understood a lot of challenges, the four key ones with respect to financials are what's on the slide, which is the higher transaction cost of these small loan sizes, uh, lack of credit history for these entrepreneurs. And um, most bankers were un unaware of the possibility of the technologies that existed, especially in the livelihood space. And all of these led to like challenges in evaluation of the loans as well. Um, so for products which have a government scheme like uh, solar irrigation, uh, the bankers were quite aware of the presence of such a technology. But for the ones which do not have a scheme or are very generic, the bankers had not heard of these products. So it's kind of obvious that if they haven't heard of these products or they haven't seen enough of these around them, uh, when at the local branch manager level, they're evaluating loans for this, they are also uh, not willing to lend for these products. Next. Uh, when we look at evidence for from the existing technologies, uh, for the scope of the study, we focused on two specific technologies. One was solar powered sewing machines and the other was solar powered digital services, which include a laptop, a printer and a photocopy machine. Uh, these were the two technologies we looked at. Next slide, please. Uh, the sample we looked at was about 300. Uh, 100 sewing machine entrepreneurs and 200, 200 digital services and entrepreneurs. And about 78% uh, of our sample for sewing machines were uh, women entrepreneurs and about 72% of them for digital services were women entrepreneurs. Next. Um, the average cost of the equipment of sewing machine was about 200 to $350. And that of uh, the digital services, including the package where you get like, depending on what you pick, what combination you take, whether a laptop and a printer or a laptop, a photocopy machine and a printer, the cost was about 140 to about $500. And the median amount of loan taken by each of these entrepreneurs was about $250 uh, for sewing machines and $400 for the digital services. Next slide. Uh, and our data shows that there was an improvement um, of about 39% in their annual incomes. This is for sewing machine uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, their median annual income increased from $900 to about $1,255. Um, 
and over 60% of these enterprises now have an income of $1,100 per annum, uh, an income which only 32% of enterprises had before using the product. And I would like to bring your notice to this fact that these are uh, uh, tailors who already were having businesses in that area. So it, it's the same customer base, it's the same geography, uh, but with access to power improvement and productivity has just led them to meeting greater demand in the same area and therefore higher incomes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the payback period was about 11 months for these businesses and 60% uh, uh, of them were able to repay their loan from the increase in the income that they experienced. Next slide. Now, when we look at the digital services, uh, about 50% of these entrepreneurs were one who did not have a business before. Uh, so the other 50% already had some or the other kind of business and this was an additional uh, business that they had. Uh, so for them, the existing entrepreneurs, their income increased from 30,000 to 50,000 INR, which is about 400 to 700 US dollars. So a, a jump of about 300 US dollar, yeah. Uh, and the median annual income for the first time entrepreneurs, the ones which did not have any business before, was relatively lower, but nonetheless uh, close. Uh, it was $350. Next slide. Uh, even here, we see that for the existing businesses, 65% of them were able to meet their uh, loan installments, the demand basically through their uh, increased income, they were able to meet the payment of loans. Next. Uh, we also did a sensitivity analysis uh, where we looked at uh, the tenure and the rate of interest and we wanted to see um, what has an impact on the economic viability of these enterprises as well as uh, economic uh, sense for the financials. And we see that as the um, tenure increases, uh, it becomes economically more viable for the entrepreneurs to repay the loan because they're paying a smaller proportion of their income uh, as loan. And uh, even for the financiers, at the same rate of interest, uh, the payback period, the discounted payback period does not vary that much, uh, implying that they can still make money from an extended tenure. Uh, so especially for entrepreneurs which have only who have only one source of income, it would make sense to provide loans for longer tenures rather than uh, smaller tenures. And um, in India, the the challenge has been like a lot of these institutions uh, uh, outside of the formal banking system are uh, not able to lend for a longer tenure. Uh, and that's because of the risk perception associated with this category of uh, borrowers. So that's why this insight becomes important. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at existing policies, yeah, next one. Uh, when we look at existing policies uh, that currently exist in India, whether for small and micro businesses or for the ones that focus on solar energy, um, we see there are three broad categories. One is capital subsidy, where uh, enterprises uh, and entrepreneurs are given like a, a waiver on the value of the product. Uh, then there is the other form of assistance, which is a margin money assistance or interest subvention. Uh, and then the third category is collateral free loans. Uh, what we see is there are a lot of uh, schemes which are currently meant for micro businesses, but they do not explicitly focus on solar technologies. Uh, and uh, if they started doing that, the existing schemes itself would be able to cover a lot more uh, variety of technologies uh, without 
taking a big step in terms of any other systematic change. Uh, next slide. Um, so from the analysis of schemes, we have a few uh, recommendations that we also um, discussed with bankers and other financial regulators. Uh, one was uh, including renewable energy as a subcomponent under or as a subsector under existing schemes. Uh, second would be India has a priority sector lending which uh, for renewable energy, which includes uh, loans for entrepreneurs uh, and households uh, that want to adopt renewable energy uh, powered products. Yet, the way this is structured currently, a lot of bigger players get the loan and smaller loans do not uh, get, get the kind of same level of uh, acceptance. So uh, having subsectors or subcategories would help. Um, even some of these other sectors like uh, textile or uh, looms uh, go by a very traditional definition, uh, which makes everything uh, handmade uh, get a lot more repaid or a lot more support than mechanized versions. So looking at uh, mechanized versions of um, these sectors or including mechanization as a definition in these sectors would also help uh, a lot of solar powered appliance uh, adopters. Um, and the subsidy currently that's provided should be kept in, should, should be designed, kept keeping in mind the fact that solar powered uh, products have a higher capex. So if for the electricity operated version, the subsidy is a certain amount, that may or may not be enough if the same entrepreneur wanted to adopt a solar powered version. So these small little changes would definitely help uh, a lot of existing schemes cover more solar powered products. Um, and like any other country and any other scheme, implementation of some of these schemes, which look perfect on paper in itself is also a challenge. So there needs to be some work around that as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and the, there's a role in this sector for sector enablers and donors and other uh, civil society organizations. One would be to create awareness around solar power technologies and their economic viability, demonstrating that there is a business case and there are entrepreneurs benefiting from such an intervention. A lot of investor or financial confidence is built when we have an ecosystem which has uh, timely after sale services and maintenance and repair services. So putting that in place, uh, as manufacturers or ecosystem builders would definitely enable a lot more people to access these products. Uh, a lot of bankers mentioned seasonal variations in income depending on the nature of the business as a concern. So if uh, entrepreneurs uh, could be looking at a diversified business or are able to convey bankers through a business plan how um, they would be able to manage these seasonal variations in their income and therefore be able to repay the loan on time. Uh, that would also go a long way in improving uh, loan accessibility. Uh, and focus on loan tenure and in, in addition to interest rates would be an important aspect like we discussed earlier. Uh, this sector also needs some targeted support for uh, through funding, which is meant specifically for solar powered livelihoods, because when this is clubbed with a lot of other solar power technologies or technologies in general, the ones that have a bigger market or are more commonly known among bankers tend to get higher funding or higher loans. Um, so in order for us to have a specific uh, financing options for these technologies, there needs to be some kind of targeting. And uh, with respect to first time borrowers, I think having alternative uh, financing models such as group lending or uh, so on and so forth can help uh, actually expand that financing to more uh, entrepreneurs, especially first time borrowers. Uh, I think that will be all at my end. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Jasmita. That was um, wonderful to, to learn a bit more about your research and, and the report that, um, that people can find at your website. I think we were going to turn now to um, Rachita Misra, who is joining on behalf of Huda from Selco Foundation. Um, but... Hi, can you hear me? Ah, fantastic, yes. Yeah. So sorry that Huda couldn't join, but uh, <laughs> I'm happy to fill the place instead. Um, is that Hannah? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, presentation, or would you want me to pull it up? Oh, we've got it ready to go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So yeah. So thank you, Sasmita, for that presentation, and uh, I think a lot of the things that I'll be elaborating on through the presentation as well kind of goes deeper into some of the things that you already pointed out, and especially bring about some of the ground challenges uh, on how do we look at financing for solar powered livelihoods. Uh, what are the solutions and what are some of the things, some of the learnings that we've had over the past few years. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Sorry, could we go to the first slide? Perfect, thank you. Um, so uh, what we've been looking at is obviously uh, productive use applications from two perspectives. And when we're looking at the end user financing itself, it has been uh, for productive, for basic lighting for productive applications. That is that if there are home-based livelihoods, which we see a lot here in rural as well as urban areas, to whether there are markets, shops, that is street vendors or small petty shops, uh, lights do help them run their businesses for longer or lights do help them sometimes uh, run their businesses even daytime because they don't have good natural lighting and ventilation. So um, there is a component of financing for uh, home lighting uh, and basic things like fan or mobile charging that also um, increase productivity um, when it comes to livelihoods. But the second part more importantly has been the increasing work which has been around uh, solar powered or solar energy which is used for productive use applications which are appliances which actually help increase productivity, reduce drudgery, and actually mechanize a lot of the smaller livelihoods uh, that haven't been mechanized or modernized over the past few years. So we've been looking at different trades. So for example, uh, the textile sector, the agri sector, dairy, poultry, and all the energy requirements in that, and actually looking at not just looking at energy efficiency, which is one way that we consider to improve affordability, but after that, actually looking at uh, developing more um, specified or appropriate financial products uh, with financial institutions. And of course, uh, what we're discussing here is how to unlock them. So I'll go into details of some of the challenges. The next slide, please. So um, one of the things that we've, uh, some of the things that we've realized over the years, some overarching themes that often emerge when we work with more low income, uh, micro or small entrepreneurs. Um, one of the things has been that in most of the cases when, when a person or an entrepreneur is taking a loan from a financial institution, there is a component of uh, a certain amount, in most cases 10 to 15% of the total capex that needs to be put in as a deposit or what we refer to as margin money. Um, this sometimes can be a very significant amount itself. Uh, sometimes the entrepreneurs don't have enough savings or are not able to commit to that amount being put in as a deposit. And that itself becomes a barrier in actually them being able to unlock, unlock the, um, uh, the, uh, the finance itself. The other aspect is that what we're looking here is actually the needs of financing for an entrepreneur, and it's not just a technology that we're considering. So it is in the end a whole livelihood that he or she is taking, which includes the working capital loan in addition to the asset loan uh, for that particular trade. Um, this, uh, um, you know, many a times is often a large sum, which again relates back to the previous point which I made, which is that the margin money, which is 10 to 15 percent, becomes too too high then. Um, some of the other aspects is also that um, we've realized that for a lot of these small livelihoods, uh, there is no benchmark that is set in terms of how do their business models actually work? What are their cash flows like? How do they differ in terms of seasonalities? What do the labor changes look like? And all of those, you know, 
uh, actually define what the working capital needs are, the asset needs are, the operational costs are. So things like that need to be understood far, far more. The bankers need to understand it, the end users need to understand it, and the technology providers need to understand as well, so that we're able to cater to this market a lot better. So this leads to actually three different stakeholders that are often the key and have to work in tandem to actually make sure that the unlocking of financing is not only happening, but also happening in a sustainable manner. So the first aspect is obviously the preparedness of the financial institution itself or the bank manager or the financial um, institution representative that the end user is in the end dealing with. Um, the first thing has been, I think Sasmita pointed that to um, as well, is that there is very little awareness on the banker side or financial institution side on the availability of solar livelihood based products and also their viability. So I think the understanding uh, is still quite a lot, especially in rural areas that uh, solar is maybe only for lighting, water heating, water pumping. Uh, that is a limited range that you can actually look at when it comes to powering through solar energy. The other aspect has been that it has not been, uh, in many projects that have been done in uh, rural areas specifically, um, solar projects that is, have not been looked at in combination with servicing, which has meant that they have not been working very well. Uh, they have been sort of, um, in a way, you can say they're non-performing assets, which is that, uh, you know, end users have stopped paying for it or they're lying uh, uh, as, as uh, you know, unused assets. And because of that, bankers don't see them uh, viable to be uh, financed. The other aspect is uh, there is no specific target set or there are no uh, specific circulars that are there to finance for livelihood itself. But the opportunity is that, as Asmita said as well, that there are plenty schemes that are available for micro and small entrepreneurs. But how do you combine with energy loans is something that they still don't know, which is which requires uh, you know a conversation, which requires a lot of back and forth. Um, there is a certain amount of coordination that happens between the departments as well for unlocking of schemes, which at a ground level sometimes creates confusion in terms of bankers not knowing how to actually process loans to be able to unlock that scheme. That creates a kind of riskiness attitude or high risk attitude in the mind of the banker or the financial institute because of which they wouldn't process a, a loan. Um, it, because of this long convincing time, it usually takes uh, uh, a long convincing period or process. It usually takes time uh, from the time that you actually send an application to the time that it actually pro is processed. And that means that you have a clean energy enterprise who is waiting for the loan to get processed and an end user who's actually getting impatient and might back out by the time that actually the loan gets processed. So that again is, is one, of the, one of the barriers. Um, we have been working with this idea of creating champion banking, uh, bankers or champion financial institutions, uh, where we actually train them on all of the above challenges that I just mentioned. Uh, but the problem that we face as practitioners is that you change, you actually, uh, uh, you know, change the attitude of one bank manager, but, you know, two years later, he's shifted to a new district, a new bank as well, or a new, um, you know, uh, uh, branch and that means that you have lost the uh, candidate who was actually going to unlock the financing, uh, financing in that area and you have to start again from scratch, um, which as a practitioner, it becomes a, a, a issue. The other thing is that loads of times what we've been seeing is we work in areas where uh, because of various reasons, either the financial products not being designed to suit the end users, uh, improper collection mechanisms, uh, various different reasons, there is a higher uh, NPA that exists in the area for the end users itself. So there is again that perception that we should not lend as banks because they we, the, we, will, we would not get the money back. And that perception again, even stops them from having that discussion of is this solution viable for the end user who's actually applying for the loan or not. Um, the second stakeholder here, which is also extremely important, is the clean energy enterprise or the enterprise who's actually providing the solution. Um, more important than actually, uh, you know, having the, that product offering itself, which sometimes is 
uh, is itself a big gap. There is no innovation, there is no technology which is actually catering to the needs of the customers that I'm looking at. Um, the supply chain of that might not be there. The spare parts might not be there. Technically, my technicians might not be qualified to actually look at servicing of that. And that raises issues around the capacity of the enterprise to actually sell that solution to actually help in servicing and maintaining that solution itself. It also, uh, uh, you know, uh, curbs the um, capacity of the enterprise to actually talk about the uh, the the impact of it or talk about the um, the benefits of it to either the banker or the end user itself, which helps, which basically stops him from making the best marketing pitch or actually convincing the banker on how uh, suitable it would be for the customer that he's catering to. The, um, the last uh, stakeholder here is the end user who's actually the customer who's looking at using the, uh, the livelihood solution that is, um, you know, that we're talking about here. Um, one thing as I already said is that there is a lot of follow-up that is required from the end user to actually turn the loan application into an actual loan which is dispersed. And sometimes it means that this is really high transaction cost. Uh, banks uh, don't have the best infrastructure. I know that in India, we do have a very good infrastructure in comparison to some of the other countries, but it still requires at times for you to travel half a day, uh, send, spend time with the banker, come back, which means a loss of daily wage. Um, and because of that, because of that high transaction cost, end users don't end up following and they're then their uh, loan applications are just sitting in the um, bank branches and not getting processed. Uh, there is a certain amount of paperwork uh, that needs to be done in order to unlock loans from the end user side as well. Uh, usually these are business plans that need to be submitted in addition to all kinds of documents about their business registration as well. Uh, these enterprise in many cases do not have these documents ready and do not have access to people or services that can help them get that document ready, or even the monies that they would require to actually have someone to uh, do that documentation for them. And that again stops them from, from submitting the application in the right manner, the paperwork in the right manner that it makes easier for the bank manager to process it. Which means again that the end user will have to travel back and forth, uh, catering to the different needs of the bankers, again increasing his or her transaction cost. And of course, a lot of the end users that we work with, this is their first time that they're actually taking a loan from a formal financial institution. And the lack of that credit history, uh, again, makes him or her uh, a high risk candidate uh, for the banker to actually process the loan. So these are, uh, you know, the broad challenges that are there. And if we can go to the next slide, please. <coughs> so, um, there are three, there are three uh, kind of uh, you know, tasks or aspects of work that come in based on the challenges that I just said, uh, which need to be looked into and they complement each other. So one is obviously that we need to look at uh, you know, uh, actually having local enterprises, last mile enterprises who are ensuring that the right need is matched to the right technology. But in addition to that, that there are there is a local supply chain, there are technicians, there is servicing and maintenance that is actually uh, given to the last mile customer. So he continues to benefit from the technology, which means he continues to impact in terms of increase in income and thus paying the bank loan back. Uh, the second is that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done in actually improving the, um, the affordability of technology itself by creating the right benchmarks in terms of the technical product. The more we work on efficiency, the more affordable solar powering that product also becomes. Um, financial product also needs to be worked upon. Uh, we at Selco look at it in two ways. One is obviously we look at unlocking of existing financial products, but depending on on the cash flows, depending on uh, the viability of the technologies, we, we also look at actually discussing with um, you know, different government departments on what should be the interest rate, what should be the interest subsidies that could actually help make the reach of the product much faster. So there's a lot that can be done in the innovation of financial products as well. And last is, of course, that we need to look at the end user perception. We need to look at the financiers value chain as well and look at awareness and capacity building across that to make sure that 
they are setting targets, they're having MOUs, they, the bank managers know how to finance, do due diligence, uh, integrate with other schemes so that we're looking at the best financial product being delivered to the end user itself. Next slide, please. Now, um, what do we mean by uh, when we say we have to actually work with uh, bankers or financial institutions on their preparedness? Um, we've realized over the years through experience that we cannot just work at one level. We cannot work with a local bank, bank manager and uh, hope that he continues to unlock financing out of goodwill. He needs to be pushed by you know, workshops which actually give him information at a state level through banking um, uh, training uh, institutes. Uh, he, needs to, he or she needs to be, again, um, uh, actually incentivized by uh, MOUs that are signed by regional managers, which push him or her to deliver on those targets itself. Um, and we have to also work at national level to actually work on new schemes uh, or, or uh, MOUs with, with larger uh, national level financing bodies like NABAD, which is the National uh, Bank for um, Agriculture and Rural Development, and SIDBI, which is the bank for, um, again, micro or small enterprises, to actually make sure that we have the right financial products that we're pushing down through the local, at the local level. Next slide, please. In terms of enterprises as well, as I already said, uh, there needs to be uh, they need, there can be a lot of work that is done by the enterprises itself to help the end users um, unlock the financing as well as build the financing ecosystem for their own enterprises growth and future sales uh, in the regions of, the, of their work. Um, they can actually facilitate a lot of the uh, connections that the end users need to create the right kind of bankable proposals. Um, in, in addition to if you're looking at the HR or the human resources that an enterprise needs to function as a last mile uh, distribution uh, enterprise, um, you know you not just you don't just need um, you know your your managers your uh, technicians your uh, sales agents but you also need people who are able to talk to bankers convince them to finance and tell them how to finance which scheme what paperwork what process needs to be done and those are important aspects of uh, capacity that needs to be built in addition to their regular technical capacity specific that can help them unlock financing at a local level um, in some cases, we've also realized that uh, having more app-based trackers, which actually look at repayment performance, can also help increase, uh, provide an evidence to the next banker that comes in, in terms of how well the end users have been performing, the technology is being used, um, and what impact it is having, which, en which in a way ensures viability of the technology and maybe the payment that the end users would do from there on. Next slide, please. And Rashida, if you don't mind taking about just one minute on this slide so we can have some time for Q&A as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to end user preparedness, um, as it points out here, um, there are a number of loans that the end users already tap into. Um, and the loans that we're talking about productive use applications can actually be just packed into this. So there are agriculture loans, there are artisan loans, um, there are loans that are specifically available to them because they're part of a self-help group or a joint liability group. And the loans that we're talking about through energy productive use applications could be just merged into this or converged into these existing loan packages. Um, as I've already said, uh, you know, there is enhancing of bankability of the end users could be done in multiple ways as well, improving their proposals that they're having ready, uh, looking at their credit history, um, helping them improve that itself or providing evidence that can say that they have a good credit history or making sure they have all their uh, know your customer or KYC documents ready, which will again help the banker process the loan itself. Um, how to talk to a banker is sometimes a, a, a challenge that we don't think would be an actual challenge on the ground, but is of, of, um, often a barrier that we have seen with the kind of end users that we work with. Um, and that is something that we again work on, on actually inspiring them to go into a bank, ask for a loan and be will be willing to follow up on that loan itself um, uh, as something that they need for their enterprise to grow. So um, I will end here. Uh, uh, these are some of the challenges that we've been looking at and it requires interventions at multiple levels.
politics from the very local level to the national level and there are ways that it can be done but uh, but it is a very challenging task and one of the key barriers in scaling up of uh, livelihood um, interventions Rashida, thank you so much, and thank you again for stepping in um, on such short notice. Um, we will go ahead and turn to Diana, and I'll, I'll mention that um, the Q&A function is open, so if you want to start adding your questions, please go ahead and do so there. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and hello, everyone. Um, yes, so I'm talking from the experience of Energy for Impact, um, we're, and we operate in Africa. Maybe we can go to the less, next slide. And I think the one after where we, yes, the next one, yes. So um, we operate, as I say, in, in five African countries. That's where we have offices, but we cover more or less the whole sub-Saharan African region. Um, we have been in operation since the last 12 years, and our main focus is to create access to clean energy and improve livelihoods. So uh, we measure our impact in terms of how many SMEs and micro enterprises we have supported, how many people have access to energy, and you can see some of the other indicators here as well. But in the interest of time, we can move on to the next slide. Yes, um, so Energy for Impact basically categorizes um, our work in several activities and productive use of energy or livelihoods through solar energy is one of them. But actually they also uh, touch upon most all other areas we are working in as um, income generating activities, especially in rural areas, are created from different um, activities, could be through farming, micro enterprises, um, but also social institutions uh, like schools and health clinics. So this just gives you an overview of um, how we kind of define that work. Next slide, please. In terms of um, productive uses or creating income and livelihoods through solar energy, um, how do we look at that? And um, of course, we have to put it into the into the rural context. And the activities that mainly happen are agriculture, um, primary activities, uh, commercial and industrial activities that uh, generate income or increase productivity of existing activities through the use of electricity. And um, actually, the productive use itself or the livelihood created through it is often constrained by the type of power that is supplied or its source of power. So that could be a national grid, could be a mini grid, could be a solar home system or a standalone system. Um, of course, the, the different capaci capacities of those systems then influence um, the productive use that can be um, created out of it. Um, what do we find mostly? It's the small micro businesses um, in the rural areas that are just the typical village businesses, which are mostly commercial and retail businesses, um, like retail shops, grocery shops, hair salons, phone charging, um, a bit of entertainment through maybe video show, um, music entertainment and things like that. Uh, we also have, of course, the primary agriculture activities and some processing and some light manufacturing, especially carpentry and some welding and, and other activities. To some extent, we find also anchor clients that uh, uh, create larger loads for power providers and some commercial and industrial, maybe a palm oil factory, flower farm, tourist lodges, and so on. And lastly, we have a concept um, that uh, is quite uh, prevalent here in the region, a key maker model um, that was developed by some of our partners, uh, where actually the power producer and provider uh, plays an active role in the development of the livelihoods and productive use uh, value chain. Next slide, please. Uh, so why do we focus on this? Uh, because productive use really creates a sustainable approach to rural development. So um, of which energy access is part of it, of which access to finance is part of it, but it's actually much broader. Um, so productive use, create incomes, create jobs, um, create access to a diversified, diversified product and service range. And uh, since those activities are happening in the rural areas, all the value addition created through that often stays in the rural areas and creates this multiplier effect of the additional income earned and value created um, flows back into the economy, into the rural village economy on the ground. Um, so we help those communities to transition slowly from more the traditional economic activities and more uh, lower value activities of retail and services to more value add activities of manufacturing and processing. 
On top of that, uh, we put a gender lens. And of course, productive use and uh, livelihoods through off-grid energy creates also an opportunity for women um, to become empowered and increase their income uh, generation activities and opportunities. So far, maybe a bit uh, in contrast to what we've seen from the India experience, is that um, female particip participation in those activities are rather low in the region here, um, but of course more prevalent in the retail and services activities compared to the processing and manufacturing. And that's probably just because those are activities traditionally occupied by men. So there's quite some, um, some change and awareness raising to be done. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned the value creation and of course the value creation has several aspects to it and one aspect is employment creation. So there is a study that was undertaken by Powerful, the Powering Jobs Census that was launched earlier this year that shows that the decentralized renewable energy sector employs uh, twice as many um, workers through informal jobs compared to formal jobs and actually five times as many through productive use jobs. So that really tells us the potential that productive use and uh, off-grid livelihood ge uh, generation has uh, for the, uh, the off-grid and rural population in general. But of course there are several elements that touch on it and it just not, doesn't happen through just providing energy. There are several other enabling factors uh, that uh, need to be considered and that we work with or walk around with as well, which is the market access, uh, supply chains and user finance that we heard about a lot uh, from the India experience, community engagement and also training and capacity building to those businesses. Next slide, please. Um, so this illustrates a bit on if we have a, a productive use enterprise or solar uh, enabled livelihood, um, what are the elements that feed into it? So first of all, of course, we need um, electrical equipment. And uh, in the case of India, we've seen the sewing machines, we've seen the IT package. Uh, there, there may be many more. There's a very, quite a long list on uh, solar powered productive use or livelihood appliances. Um, we also need to look at the supply chain in general. So you may have the appliance, but where does your raw material come from? Um, the inventory that you need in order to make the business um, uh, sustainable and growing. Um, the financing is an element of it and that is the financing for the equipment as well as the financing for the inventory as well as financing for working capital and expansion. And finally, does the staff and does the um, operator of the business have the skills uh, they need and the capacity they need in order to operate the machinery and the business sustainably. So as such, there's probably not one standard approach we can use in order to deploy uh, productive use. Um, but of course, there are certain elements we have to look at and uh, contextualize them. And of course, from every village and every economy has its very own specific um, specifications. And especially in Africa, where, ha where we have as many countries, uh, we always need to start from the point of um, the local village, the local enterprise, look at their needs, look at what does exist in terms of economic opportunities and value chains in that uh, specific context, and how can the productivity be increased or new businesses be created uh, with the resources we have locally in order to re create also near-term gains. Um, of course, you can look at creating new opportunities, new value chains that takes much more time compared to leveraging on what is already there. Uh, and on top of that, we have the access to finance element as well as the business support that the entrepreneurs need in order to um, create a sustainable business. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is an um, example from a project we implemented in Tanzania where we worked with 59 villages and productive use development in those villages. Um, those, company, uh, those businesses were connected through the national utility grid, Tanesco. Um, but in the end, uh, the, the way we measure productive use doesn't really matter whether it's uh, solar uh, powered, off-grid, standalone or grid connected. So you will find um, in order to measure the success of the uh, livelihood creation and productive use development, uh, you will most likely find those three elements in, in all of those scenarios. Um, the, the value created through the productive use businesses um, have elements that translate to value to the power user and to the power supplier. So we, you will find an additional increase in profits to the 
to the enterprise, which we have seen from the CEW um, example as well. You will also find that there will be additional jobs created within the enterprise if there is growth at the enterprise or additional needs for skills. Um, so those are value created at the local level. And then we have um, additional revenue for the power company or for the mini grid company, or even if it's um, you know, a distributor of a solar home system company, there's additional revenue created for them through supplying their system, which rather seems to be the smaller share. The, most of the value is created at the power user and the productive use level. And that of, um, suggests that there is actually uh, a greater interest in terms of um, this being a public good in order to create um, sustainable return on investment for the community as well as for private sector through um, involvement of the, of the power providers. Um, yes, you will find some more statistics from this particular project here and if there's any question I'm happy to answer it later. Uh, we can go to the next slide please. Um, this looks at uh, the typical sector activities, the appliances used in some of those activities, their power needs, um, their cost of the equipment, as well as the payback period over time. I think it relates quite well to the India experience as well. So you will find most of the equipment, um, irrespective of the sector activities or even the um, particular business activity, are quite, quite low value. Uh, below $500 or so, very often $100 to $200. And therefore also the payback periods for those um, uh, productive use enterprises are quite low, less than a year very often, as you see here, a couple of months. So that suggests that um, there is still quite an interesting business case to be made to financiers and private sector to invest into productive use and uh, off-grid livelihood activities. Um, because there is a business case um, that suggests it's sustainable given uh, all enabling factors are in place. So you can go to the next slide, please. And um, this provides an overview of um, how, not only from a financing point of view, but from an enabling environment point of view, uh, productive use or off-grid livelihoods can be approached. Um, that's um, basically a summary of our experience and our approach. Uh, that we are happy to share. Um, so it starts really with awareness creation. We heard before that very often um, rural households or businesses are not aware of what can be done with a solar enabled equipment. Um, so we engage with the communities and uh, create and demonstrate that awareness and uh, those business cases. Then it cannot be done in isolation. So we create a lot of partnerships and linkages and that creates equipment suppliers, that creates um, access to markets as well as the whole supply chain and access to finance, of course. Uh, and that very often involves the local financial institutions that can be from the informal sector or formal sector, such as M MFIs and banks. Um, we talked about value chains. So um, of course, creating awareness of the rural value chains and local value chains available in the different uh, sectors we are, we are looking at. Uh, we need access to markets for the new products and services created um, that help those businesses to actually um, yeah, find a market and uh, generate the revenue, that, uh, they, which is often a new um, area for them if it's a new business um, or new activity that is being created here. We talked about the business acumen of the enterprise themselves. I think that is a general uh, need for many rural MSMEs in general, whether they are um, uh, operating off grid, on the grid, uh, with solar powered equipment or not. Um, you will find those are elements that reoccur um, irrespective of, of, um, of the off grid element. And of course, we include the women empowerment aspect here as well in order to cre create more awareness and incentives for women to be more engaged in uh, off grid activities. There's also the aspect of technical support. Um, so there's through the mechanization process and the electrical equipment being provided, uh, which is very often the first time interaction for some of those businesses with such technologies, you need to overcome some of the perceptions. You need to create more awareness and knowledge on how to operate um, those equipment, but that may also include the power provider or the uh, provider of the equipment um, that needs to be you know, um, configured in order to create the, um, the productive use 
uh, in that particular case. So to give an example, maybe that is a mini grid provider that um, needs also support in order to identify electrical equipment that can be powered through the grid uh, that is needed by those local businesses um, that needs to be put on ground and installed and also um, operated. And the last one is, of course, monitoring those results that, and the, um, uh, that we are creating on the ground, um, which can be done through various means and is probably more an organizational task, not so much for the business, but for us. Next. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm wrapping up here uh, very briefly that uh, we see productive use and solar uh, powered livelihoods are really feeding into the broader picture of rural development and the green growth and employment agenda. And um, I'll probably stop here. All the other points are just summarizing more or less what I touched upon and we can clarify some of them through Q&A if need be. Thank you. Thank you so much. A oh, wonderful presentation and um, we appreciate your, your insights here. I'll note that we are just about out of time, so maybe I will give a quick overview of some of the questions that have come in, and we will ask our presenters to respond to them via email in the next few days. Um, we had a great question on control of product quality and durability and any steps to take, make sure that um, the products that are being issued loans are, are of high standard and quality. Um, we had a question about the study's decision to look at um, banking institutions and micro microfinance institutions rather than some of the PAYGO business models to, to meet these um, unique consumer financing needs. Um, we also had other questions about um, uh, uh, examples of some of these commercial lending practices for appliances that are really performing well and, and um, getting loans out to entrepreneurs that need them. Um, we also had a quick clarifying questions on which types of financing institutions did the study focus on and survey, um, as well as a request to share maybe some of the um, analyses on um, uh, net present value and, and some of the data underlying um, the CEW research. Um, and lastly, we had a question about um, if, there, if the presenters had any resources to help energy access companies design trainings and workshops for these rural entrepreneurs, um, perhaps addressing some of the other ecosystem needs that they might be facing. Uh, so we will ask each of you to kind of take some time and think about that offline, but maybe in the last few minutes we'll go over, since this is such a incredibly rich uh, discussion with lots to, um, lots to unpack, if you can um, take maybe one or two minutes to um, give us kind of your concluding thoughts and um, any, any last bits you would like to mention. Maybe we'll start with you, Sasmita. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I feel the sector, based on what we have understood, there's a definitely a big role for financials to play, but I think ecosystem uh, enablers uh, and enterprises, as well as donors, have an equally important role to play uh, to start facilitating and unlocking some of these financial options by coming in to set up funds or by coming in to enable these smaller uh, clean energy enterprises, uh, provide good after sale services uh, or by covering up for like margin money and giving margin money assistance so that more uh, small entrepreneurs can start borrowing. So I think it will need more than just financials to unlock finance in this sector. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's a great point. Rashida? Yeah, one of the things I would like to kind of add on uh, to the discussion already is that with uh, productive use applications, what we've also seen is that it does require long-term financing from our experience in India. So we're not talking about, you know, six-month, one-year loans in many cases, though we need to look at two-year, three-year, five-year loans. And it connects to one of the questions that came in, which is about high quality. Uh, bankers then do look at, uh, you know, technologies which offer better warranties and servicing networks. And that's where the whole coordination between the end user, the enterprise who's actually delivering and servicing the technology and the banker comes in. So there is uh, affordability that needs to be look at, looked at both from the technology side, as well as financing, not just from the interest rate, but also the term of the product that 
that kind of uh, you know comes in and uh, you know that's where as as sasmita also said uh, it's the enabling factors around the financiers as well that sometimes makes it possible for them to finance in a sustainable way so yeah thank you excellent additions thank you so much um diana i think we will conclude with you Thank you. Um, I think I would like to add on the alternative financing channels, and maybe that is because here in the region, maybe the sector operates a little bit different. Um, banks and the former sector are very risk averse. So we as an organization, as well as the sector overall, has piloted quite a number of initiatives around alternative financing that could come through crowdfunding, that could come through the power provider. We heard Paygo as a question, but there's also mini grid developers that are um, quite um, instrumental in uh, providing access to finance and uh, putting some of those appliances and creating some of the PU businesses on the ground. Um, there are also some of the formal financial institutions, um, but uh, not at the scale maybe that we have seen from the India experience. So happy to yeah, create more lessons learned with each other. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure we could take a whole another hour um, to continue this conversation. There's so much here. Um, I will briefly mention that our next and final webinar of 2019 uh, will discuss the latest Poor People's Energy Outlook with Partners Practical Action and a handful of discussants um, that will de go into uh, the drivers and solutions to energy poverty in their latest report um, and will take place on December 16th. You can register through se for alls webinar page and we'll also send out an email reminder. Um, just to close and let you all continue with your day, I'll say we appreciate everyone's time and um, thank you for asking such compelling questions. Apologies for not having um, time to get into all of them here. Uh, we especially want to thank our presenters for sharing their incredible work today and um, taking the time to allow this deep dive into uh, such a, an important question in the sector. Thank you all and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Caroline.